Hey everybody, welcome to this week's stream. I hope you're all doing good today. So I apologize, I totally thought that I set the stream up yesterday and uh, basically all I did was take the picture and save that. Um, so um, I was kind of in and out of the shop and I, uh, you know, so I'm trying to like start this the thing today and I'm looking for it and I'm like, oh, I didn't set it up. So that's why we're starting a little bit late today. Sorry about that. Um, so today we're gonna be turning up some of those, uh, actually, let me go get the blanks. Um, we're going to do a couple experimental uh, dirty pour blanks <clears throat> that we did last week. We were kind of playing around with, um, for anybody that doesn't know what dirty pour means, it means like if you have like three or four colors, um, you know, you're going to mix them up in separate cups and then basically dump them all into the same cup and then just pour it all like at once rather than doing like multiple cups, um, you know, like multiple different pours um, during into the mold itself. Um, so this is something that I've been, every time I kind of, it, it, I seem to get similar results every time. And um, what happens is the colors tend to, uh, you know, you want to have, I don't know, thicker bands. Like you're, you're, you're hoping to get band, different colored bands, you know, that you can just pour all at once. But they tend to get really thin and that's kind of what happened again. So I, I don't know how these are going to turn out. They look pretty cool on the outside. Um, they've got some like really interesting like patterns basically so i don't know and you know obviously this is just the outside of the blank we don't know what's on the inside and i totally screwed up when i demolded these we did two different experiments and i totally just mixed them all up so i have no clue what we're turning um they all kind of look like this one looks like maybe like one of the first pours or or something because there's a lot more colors going on and the, at the beginning, when I first poured it, there was more like thicker bands. And then it just kind of, as things went down, you know, as more resin came out of the cup, um, it started to get a lot closer together. Now it looked very muddy and these, these still look kind of muddy on the outside, like where colors kind of bled together. And we really waited till the end of the, you know, the working time. Um, but it's not so much that they bled together, it's, it's that they look, you know, the, like the bands are so close together um, that that's what this is, you know, looking like. But, you know, again, there's like really interesting things going on. Um, and the insides may hold some, some treasures, <laughs> let's say. So anyway, I just randomly picked two blanks because like I said, I screwed up and just demolded them and kind of dumped them all in a pile. So I don't know which ones. Uh, we, we did two different experiments where, what do we do? Um, oh, we used uh, two different like size cups. Let's see, what did I do? We did, I think, uh, let me think about this. What did we do? can't remember for a hundred percent sure but basically the idea was we tried one cup that was like a wider mouth and one that was kind of a, a thinner uh you know diameter just to see if you know anything because I, I just to see if anything changed uh, with that um so i don't know looking at the outsides there's no massive differences between any of these that's so <laughs> i don't know like i said this is why it's kind of hard sometimes when i when i do experiments because I kind of screw things up like that. Um, I'm trying to get like a video and I'm focused on like getting the camera angles and all that kind of stuff and then I just I don't think about what I'm doing. So I, I did think of one other um, idea. Uh, you know, again, the issue that I'm having is things like band together, like especially the farther you go down in the cup, it just seems like all of those different colors kind of get really squished together. So what I was thinking is, and I don't know if this is gonna change anything because I'm not sure what the dynamics are that are going on here. Um, but I was thinking, uh, well, I, I just thought of another idea <clears throat> to try and keep thicker bands or, or keep things a little bit more separated next time. One thing is instead of, we, we basically just did equal amounts of each color. One thing that might be kind of cool is like, let's just say that you were doing two colors you could do like a thicker amount of one color and then a thin amount of the, the next and kind of stack it that way. That might separate things out a little bit more. Uh, at least it might be different. Um, so I wanted to mention that we might do that down the road. Um, I'd like to see how that performs, let's say. 
And then the other thing that I actually just thought of is rather than doing one big cup of resin, like we did, um, you know, we just basically poured all the resin into something like, you know, this or, or, or you know, the taller, skinnier one. But another way to do this is that, that may keep, uh, my, my logic is, it seemed to be a lot um, less um, banded together, like thin amounts of each color at the beginning. And so one thing that you could do, maybe, I, this starts to get a little bit complicated and I don't know if the outcome is really worth all this work necessarily, but um, one thing you could do is instead of pouring all the resin in one cup, you could pour, you know, like two or three, you know, like a, a few layers into a bunch of different cups, even if it's all the same colors in each one. And then that might kind of keep things a little bit more separated. So I just wanted to kind of share a couple thoughts that I had about this. Um, all that said, I don't know. This might have turned out really awesome. We have to see what's on the inside. So we're going to turn some pens today. Um, I couldn't find, I, did, I didn't have any longer. I was, I was going to go for like a longer single blank, but I, I don't have any of those. I have like Sierra style. Uh, for the most part, and I and I just want to do, you know, this will give us enough information just turning these back. However, what I did do um, that I think is going to be cool, and I've been kind of holding on to these, so uh, Turner's Warehouse sells these um, Element Series uh, pen kits, and so they've got a bunch of different ones. They've got copper, brass, I I'm going to probably miss some of these, but copper, brass, aluminum, uh, stainless steel, and there might be one other one that I can't think of. Um, but they're basically, it's, they're made, I mean, they're like solid metal um, rather than like a plating or something like that. And the cool thing about this is, especially with the brass and copper, uh, which that's not what we're using today because I want to, it would be a, a slightly different thing that we're doing. But I want to pull these out. I got, I got a couple of these um, with the brass and the, the copper. The coolest thing about these is you can patina these. Um, which means like you can basically corrode the the metal um, and you get like they just look awesome um, and there's different methods there's different chemicals that you can kind of expose these to and it'll basically you know age them um, and put a, a different like turn them different colors um, like your copper is gonna probably turn like the green color uh, when you when you expose I'm not uh, I'm not I haven't done this yet this is something that I want to do down the road I just haven't had time but um, like I said it's solid metal uh, all the components and so you can just expose it to uh, does anybody know what what chemical you would expose copper to and it'll turn blue and there's uh, different things like there's like ammonia and uh, maybe like bleach um, what are some of the other ones I can't remember I haven't I haven't thought about patina ing for a while and that's why I haven't gotten to these yet but <clears throat> we'll do that someday uh, one of the biggest things is if you're gonna patina it you want the right blank um, you know to, to kind of match with that so instead of doing patina ing um, I thought this would be a good chance to test out the aluminum versus the stainless steel and the big deal about this is they are significantly different weights um, the stainless steel is much heavier and I actually wanted to weigh these parts. I'm just going to leave them in the bags. It'll be kind of apples to apples, but it should give you kind of an idea. So these are the main components. The only things left are the, the ink and the, the little transmission thing. Um, but I just wanted to weigh the, the components themselves. So the aluminum is 12 grams. And I mean, this is very light. If you're looking for a light pen kit, because some of these pen kits, you know, you start adding blanks and doing all this stuff and the, the hardware can get to, to end up being a pretty heavy pen. Um, so that was 12 grams for the aluminum. And then the stainless steel, much heavier, 30. Um, so, I mean, it's like more than twice as heavy as the aluminum components. So, like I said, I just kind of wanted to, to play with these. Um, I'm not sure if, I don't think you can really do a whole lot of like patina work to the aluminum. There may be something you can do to stainless steel. I, I kind of doubt it. It's more about just the finish on these. Um, and so that I thought this would be a good test. We can make one of each of these and, uh, and just kind of see how these pen kits do. They're basically like a Sierra style or a Wall Street or a Majestic. 
Is that what, I don't know. You know, that, like that line, the single, single uh, blank um, kind of just twist pen. So anyway, that's what we're going to do today. Um, that was kind of a long intro, but I was kind of also waiting for people that may not have heard that we were <laughs> doing a stream today because I s forgot to set it up. Um, so let's go back, and it uh, looks like Mark was here first, and uh, I just got something really cool from Mark, and we're going to get to use it today. Uh, Mark sent a really cool um, magic juice holder. Look at this thing. He even put like quotes on it. Look at this. Read the quote. It's really good. It's like zooming in and out. Uh, hopefully that's... Okay, the cameras are just not... There we go. <laughs> so that's hilarious. And this is a great quote too. I like this one. to hide myself there we go i guess i should just read it life is so much simpler when you stop explaining yourself to people and just do what makes you happy and then the other one was woodworking is one third planning one third execution and one third looking for the tool you just sat down <laughs> so, true enough and uh the cool thing is it's got a magnet on the bottom um he signed it too down there somewhere Pretty cool stuff. And so now, instead of me like grabbing every single bottle, I can just bring this whole little kit over to the lathe and it won't fall off because there's a magnet on the bottom. So really appreciate it. I think, uh, I think Mark's making these things if you want to get a hold of him. Um, I think you can pick one up too if you got a, a, a magic juice bundle. Um, I, that was, I, I had the one, so Stadium Pen Blanks sells, I think they sell it. Um, it's like a 3D printed thing. Um, and I had one for the one ounce bottles. <clears throat> the only issue I had with that is it's like one long thing, which is kind of kind of a pain. I really like the six pack version. So I, uh, Mark made that because I have two ounce bottles that don't have a little holder. So it, it's going pretty good. Let's see here. We got Mike McEwen's here. Kim's here. Yeah, I to like I said, I totally forgot to... I, I took the picture and got everything set up, but I was I was running... My mom was in the hospital, and I had to pick her up, and I didn't know when that was going to be, and then she called, and I'm like, oh, my God. So I was kind of in and out yesterday, and things just got a little hectic, but anyway. Um, hey, Jen, I'm doing good. Doing pretty good. Uh, my knee feels good today. Had an incident. I, I'm calling them incidents when it, like... I don't know what the what it's doing, but it clicks kind of it feels like it's like popping out sort of monday through wednesday were excellent it was feeling great and then thursday i got on a bike and i was i extended my leg up and it like kind of popped and then i then it popped out when i was walking again so i don't know what's going on i got a, a, a um appointment with a surgeon on of course you have to wait a month and a half to get in to see anyone so we'll see what happens uh, but today it feels better. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, let's see here. Who else is here? Uh, Chris is there. I'm doing pretty good, Chris. And let's see here. Anybody? Vinny's here too. Nice. And Art. Art's in the house. Oh yeah, the two ounce three D. Yeah, that's that's interesting too. Yeah, I didn't think about that. They'd be a lot bigger because the one, you know, twice as big. Interesting, interesting. Actually, Vinny, you're right on time because I, <laughs> I forgot to set up the stream last night, uh, yesterday, and so I'm like, it, it's like noon, and I'm like, oh, let me log on and start it up, and it's not there, and I was like, oh man, I forgot. So anyway, uh, I think that's about it. So again, uh, it'll be interesting to see how these things turn out. Um, I do think, so one thing that I will share um, that, that, you know, again, you look at the outside and you're like, I don't know, it could be interesting, but it's not, you know, I don't know kind of thing. So here's the outside. Again, you can see like it's very tightly banded, um, uh, you know, colors. However, if you look at the ends, that's a little bit more interesting. You know? So these, you know, again, never trust what the outside shows on, on a, especially on a round blank, because you just never know uh, what you're gonna actually get on the inside. Especially the way, uh, you know, the other thing is, you know, I just dumped it and I wasn't like moving the, the cup or doing anything. 
And so if you think about it, um, do I have a, let me get my mold so I can kind of explain. I basically just, and this is, again, technique is everything with, with, with certain types of pouring. All I did was just dump it down there, which means that it's probably rolling kind of down the same side, uh, mostly. And so, it, it, you know, you may end up getting, and I think that's why, you know, you get like this one single pattern with a bunch of like lines, because it was just kind of bunching up. But in the middle, and even on the other side, there's different colors going on. So you, you just never know, you know, you really have to turn. And this is why, like, when I make a new blank, I got to turn quite a few different samples and, and pour multiple times to make sure that, you know, doing, trying to do the same technique produces the same results. All right, so we got our two blanks ready to go. Again, I totally screwed up and uh, I didn't, I was, we did two different pours, slightly different techniques and I totally mixed all the blanks up and didn't keep them separated. So I don't know which ones we got. I just grabbed a couple randomly. I don't know that that would have made a significant difference. Um, and the outsides of the blanks look pretty similar. Um, like, you know, when you look at all of them, the real difference, the only difference that I really saw was um, what I think is like the, the initial pour. And I, I mean, I could see this visibly when we actually did it. At the beginning, there was wider separation of colors and then it just, like the colors kind of got thinner and thinner and thinner as you went down the cup as you were pouring it. And I don't know how to get around that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, doing dirty pours on like a canvas, um, there's lots of people that do that. And, uh, you know, you can kind of figure out how to do that and get, you know, certain results. Um, I, I just don't know that there's a lot of people pouring into pipes, <laughs> basically, um, doing a dirty pour. And they certainly aren't sharing if they figured out some sort of a tech, you know, technique that works. All right, so fire up the dust collection. Oh, I gotta get my phone out. Uh, let's see here. Okay phone up there so I can see the comments. Got everything rolling. Where's my tool? I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit further and then we'll stop and take a peek. Because I'm as anxious as you are to see what these things look like on the inside. Okay, I think that's good. Let's get the camera around here as close as we can. Very dark. Uh, but there are different colors going on. So let me, let me add a little bit of like water or something. 
alcohol should work. And I got that a little handier. Oh yeah. Once we polish this, there there's definitely that's not bad. You can definitely yeah, it it kind of held the banding. I don't know if you can see that. I think once we polish this, um, a lot of the colors were fairly dark in here. <clears throat> I think we had like some red. It looks like I don't even know. what colors did we put in this thing. I gotta. I want to look at that. And we did the same colors and same amounts of each color for both pores. So that's not gonna change. So we did uh, red, bronze, oh silver, and then mint green. So silver. The silver isn't really popping out at me so much. Um, the bronze really takes over quite a bit. And it's interesting. I don't see. I mean, I, I think I can see some silver, but it's kind of a little bit muted. Uh, but I do think that these colors are going to come out more um, once we get this thing polished up. Sometimes, dar especially darker blanks. Um, they, they look like you're like, oh man, you know, when you're like turning it and uh, and even like really even when you're sanding it, it's still not really, it's still muted. But then once you get, you know, to your like higher polishing grits, then the, the actual colors or, you know, I don't know, it's almost like it brightens it up. Yeah. I got a pretty, pretty powerful dust collector. But having that, and I actually, I have this one, but I also have, I'm gonna show you the, for anybody that maybe doesn't know. So this, this is the stem. I don't know how far I, up I can go, but that's my, my line in, you know. And so down there, Kind of a weird angle with the. Let me turn the lathe off. With my banjo kind of sticking out, but that's that's a dust port at the bottom. And this is kind of a crucial thing actually that I learned when I was talking to Oneida, and I've talked to other people also. So this is a floor sweep, and that's great, you know, that you can kind of like just sweep, you know, your your dust in there. That's not why I have it though. What that's doing is it's it's creating a. a you know, whatever suction down to the floor. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing. You know, a lot of people have those hanging air filters. And, you know, while they work great, they're basically pulling the dust up, like into your face. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of a concept that, you know, I've been around woodworking for, you know, 20, uh, 15, 16 years, something like that. And dust collection is obviously a big deal, but I'd never even thought about the idea of, you know, the filters that we use a lot of times. Pulling that, you know, if you're working on like a lathe down here, or like a, a table saw or something like that, the dust is starting down there and then the filter, if you have it on, is pulling it into your face, basically. And so having those, you know, something on the floor, I mean, you could even just put a box fan down on the floor. Uh, with a filter on it, but having that downward flow uh, is kind of a, a slightly better way to do it. And it, not, it. In some cases, you maybe can't can't really do it. It may not like work in certain scenarios, but uh, that's the other reason why I bought the. Uh, um, oh shoot! What's it called? The um, the Stratus air filter because it's like a floor standing air filter rather than a hanging ceiling thing. Um, so anyway, I got a pretty powerful dust collection system, but it's beautiful because I don't have to wear a mask, I don't feel, uh, while I'm doing this stuff. And I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty sensitive to dust. I have allergies and all kinds of asthma. And so if I don't wear a, a, a dust mask when I'm, you know, turning something that, that's creating a lot of dust, I'm pretty much going to be sneezing. Maybe not right when I'm doing it, but that night, 
I'm gonna be sneezing a lot. And I don't find that I have to because it's pretty much sucking even the small stuff you can't see out of my face. So it's nice so I can, you know, do the, do the live streams and be able to talk. The only thing is it's really loud, obviously. So if you're looking for like one of those full shop air filters, not like a dust collector, but like, like the filter type things, the Stratus is a really nice unit. Um, the only downside for me is we have a really big shop and that thing's really not meant to handle something with 18 foot ceilings. And then realistically, our shop is technically 4,000 square feet. So, you know, outside of my 800, it's basically what I'm saying is the footprint of our shop is in the, the cubic area that it needs to filter is probably really too big to use as like a, a shop, you know, uh, air cleaner. Uh, so what I use it for though, what it does really well at is I, I mainly use it by my sanders and sometimes when my, I'm cutting really uh, dusty stuff on my bandsaw or table saw. Uh, or when I'm, I, I do certain things with my random orbit sander. And so I kind of use it, I just, and you can pull it around the shop. Like that's the beauty. A lot of those hanging air filters, you know, you got to stick it at some place in your shop that's not necessarily by where you're actually working on stuff and creating the dust. Um, but the Stratus, you can just move it right next to where, whatever you're doing. So basically though, I have another one of those uh, floor dust sweep things on the other side behind my table saw. So like two of them in the, the dust area. So I kind of use that in conjunction with the Stratus to clear the air. But I, you know, I still have to wear a dust mask, but it keeps dust from settling all over my shop. I don't, I don't, I used to have a really bad problem with that. Now that I've upgraded the, to the new, uh, new dust collector, as well as the Stratus, I don't really get piles of dust all over my shop anymore. <clears throat> Alright, let me, I've been talking for a while, let's, let's see what's going on in here. Yeah, there's, there's, you can definitely see the green in this thing. Like I said, it, it really looks just not that great right now. But I really think that right when, when we start getting into the magic juice, like the, when, when we hit it with the number one magic juice, it's gonna be like, bam, like right in your face, I think. Oh yeah, nice, you got it on sale. I like it. Uh, the only drawback, um, one thing that's kind of a pain, but it's very easy to remedy, is it doesn't have on board a. Uh, and I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I feel like I'm yelling. God. It's the only drawback to the having the dust collector running. Um, can't hear myself talk. Um, the only draw, there are a couple drawbacks um, compared to the other. Um, filter systems or whatever. Uh, I'm going to pull it around so you guys can see it because I, I did a video on it. I, so if you want to see the video, um, just search my channel for uh, probably for Stratus. Um, so one drawback that pretty much all the other ones have that are like the hanging type deals um, is it doesn't have a timer on it, which is I think a big oversight. Um, they're really simple to add to something like this. However, um, it's very simple to remedy that. Um, all you have to do is just buy, I think this thing cost me like five bucks. Maybe, I don't know, maybe 10. Pretty cheap though. Um, you can just get one of those timers. So you just plug it in and then you can choose whatever 
you know thing you want so that's a simple way to remedy the fact that it didn't come with one of these on board um, for you know another another drawback is it's definitely not cheap um, but it's kind of one of the only ones like it <laughs> so you know gotta kind of pay for what's available powermatic's got one that's kind of sort of similar um, that thing, <clears throat> I mean, I really don't think that there's any difference between you just putting a filter over a box fan and, and the Powermatic one, though. This one's a little different. So the, the air, the fan is blowing up, um, and this entire thing, 360 degrees, is a filter. Don't stand on the cord. So you can see it's all dusty right now, but it's got a pre-filter. You can get charcoal. Um, filters for it which will help a little bit with like smells like if you ever if you've ever like you know like you're cutting a piece of wood and it like burns um, you know that smell it'll help kind of take care of that kind of stuff it'll also knock down some of the smells from uh, 3d printing um, I will warn you though about the the smell thing and charcoal filters that's not necessarily removing VOCs um, in most cases it's not uh, removing them at all it just kind of knocks the smell down so just be a little bit careful with that um, especially the resin printing but yeah this thing's pretty awesome um, and actually stratus hooked me up with this i actually contacted them to see if they would want to do like a kind of a partnership thing and so um, they they hooked me up with this i did a video um, and it's it's been pretty good uh, it is kind of heavy um, but you can just kind of slide it around your shop it's not that hard um, changing or cleaning the filter you got to rotate this thing and take it off that's not super simple this thing's not totally light and you do have to get it up you know above here you can just kind of tip it over though also um, so like I said there's some drawbacks but I really for for I think a lot of us especially when you're talking like a, a wood turning shop I think it's brilliant I think it's way better than most of the other ones but <clears throat> you know something to at least be aware of i think if you if you weren't aware of it before i think it's something that you know when you're when you're looking at filters if you need to get one i do think it's worth looking at and at least kind of evaluating it for for your own use Because most of the other ones are all just basically the same kind of thing. Now, again, one thing you can do is, is kind of build your own, like using just like HVAC filters and a, like a box fan. And, and you can get even more complicated than that. Uh, Jay Bates has a pretty good video on making an air filter for your shop um, that's a little bit more powerful. It's using like one of those um, squirrel cage kind of deals. It's not just a like a box fan. Um, so... You know, but either way, it's good to have something that'll kind of clear out. Oh man, is that a bee in my shop? Or the biggest fly I've ever seen. Huh. Where'd it go? Huh. I don't know. Big fly or a bee, I'm not sure. Yeah, you could probably put it on casters. That's that's a good idea too. I don't really move it that far, so I don't I I think the the time spent doing that for me is probably not that big of a deal, but not worth it, you know. But yeah, I think you probably could do that. Okay. <clears throat> Let's finish this guy up. Let's quit talking about dust collection jeez stay on topic
How many CFMs? I have no clue. Um, uh, it's been a long time since... I don't even know if that's really like... Uh, I'm not sure if CFM is even necessarily the most important thing. I can't remember now. Um, it's pretty high. It, I mean, it's a five horse. It's the, the dust gorilla, like the big one. So, I mean, it's like way up there for, you know, whatever the specs are, CFM and all that other stuff. Um, a, a slightly cheaper option if you want to go for like the bit, like a kind of bigger, um, like whole shop system is the clear view. <clears throat> I think it's clear view. Is that right? It's a little bit more like a DIY type of deal, but they're a little bit cheaper um, and they work great. But Oneida was excellent to work with. Um, and I, they didn't, there was no partnership, no whatever. I just paid a lot of money, you know. <laughs> um, I didn't really, a ton of people like that are way bigger than me channel wise have worked with Oneida I'm sure so I didn't even want, really want to deal with that kind of stuff so that was just out of pocket money you know and I was really happy with the process they really helped me set it up again they educated me on that downward flow uh, airflow thing so really, really good, and they help you, you know, they can help you set up the entire thing if you're gonna run duct work and all that. <laughs> and Oneida also even has, um, uh, I don't know, what, uh, maybe Dust Deputy, you know, I don't know. There, there's another one that's like mobile. Um, it's like, I don't know, if you've seen the Laguna ones, it's kind of kind of sort of similar to that, but Oneida's kind of got their own. That's good. <clears throat> Let me stop it and see. That side's looking good. I'm gonna look at the angles and all that. Yeah, it's looking fine. Okay, so I'm just gonna blow it off. Turn off the dust collector. We'll pull out the, the, <clears throat> the sandpaper. Let's do some wet sanding here. So again, I'm not even gonna change the camera angle because there's not a lot to look at right, right here. Now, I didn't paint the tube or do anything like that. I just pulled out the, the, the brass, you know, how it was. So uh, I think we might have gone a little thin on the mica powder, so that might have been a, an oversight. On my part, I didn't really think about that. They looked like they were pretty packed with mica, but again, I, I always recommend uh, like I said, I was kind of in a hurry when I did it, so <laughs> I didn't really think about it. Technically, I wasn't a hundred, uh, I was pretty sure, I guess, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure that it was exactly the same. I'm pretty sure it's the same tube as the Sierra. So I really should have used the painted tube, but whatever. We'll see what we get. We'll see what we get. Yeah, I, I was kind of looking at the Laguna. Um, I think that, I don't know. I don't think you can really go too wrong. 
I do think Oneida is probably a little bit better. Um, I mean, Oneida, all they do is dust collection. So I think that they have a little bit of a leg up in terms of like, you know, designing what you need to move dust. But at the same time, I don't really think the Lagunas are particularly bad or anything like that. Um, Chad's got one. He, he's been using that thing in his shop for a long time. He likes it. So they, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Main thing is you just, you know, you want to be able to collect as much dust as you can at the source. So that's why you get a dust collector. And then you want to filter out that the small particles. It's kind of a two-stage approach. And frankly, you really don't want to just ditch your mask. Um, depending now I like I said I got a pretty powerful system in here and I don't I feel pretty comfortable um, and judging by the fact that I don't go home sneezing every day like I used to I think that my system is working for me um, and I and I've even used one of the particulate matter you know if, if you're really concerned about dust um, get an air quality meter thing um, and, and they have lots there's tons of them where's my I bought this little one it was like a hundred bucks comes and you use an app with it um, I'm not recommending the you necessarily buy this there's lots of them just look around um, but you can get you can just buy one of these little sensors and then like I said it, it Bluetooth it, it connects to your phone through an app and you can monitor all kinds of different stuff including VOCs usually um, as well as particulate matter and so that'll give you an idea of how dangerous you know the 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 dust amount in your shop is at any given time. Um, I think it's it's kind of eye opening if you've never done that, uh, because a lot of times you're like, oh, everything feels fine. I'm not sneezing or you know I don't see any dust. But the truth is, you know, one of those meters won't lie. And uh, you know if your shop is constant, if you're constantly working without a mask in a dusty shop, it's not good for you. Um, you will develop some problems with your lungs um, just just from just standard wood dust you know so that'll just at least let you know you know when you know bare minimum if you're wearing a dust mask that should be good enough you know I mean you'll just have to kind of wear it all the time if you don't have a dust collector but um, it's good to know when you need to put one of those things on All right, so I'm starting here with 600 grit. I'm gonna give this a good once over. Make sure I've gotten all my tool marks and all that kind of good stuff out. Feeling pretty smooth at this point. Uh, might be a tool mark right there. I think I need to rotate my cutter on my that carbide cutter. I was using a negative rake. I think it's time to rotate it possibly. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, I still think it, I need to rotate it possibly, but because um, it's just not cutting as well as it used to. And I like to go along the length of this in a you know the perpendicular to the scratch pattern that I was putting in before. I think you just definitely get some better results by doing that. And we're gonna move up to a thousand grit. Looking at the coronet herald. Need to make it movable. Uh Do they have like a mobile type base? I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, Coronet Herald. That's, yeah, that's the, the kind of smaller of the two. I never get, I can never keep those things straight. <laughs> What's the other one? Herald, yeah, that's the, that's the kind of like midi size. Um, and then the like Regency or something like that is the other one. So I just built a cabinet, little rolly base for my Comet. I mean, I, you know, I think you, you you don't need to necessarily overdo it 
overthink it. The nice thing about doing like a cart system like that for a smaller lathe is uh, you can uh, put some storage under there. So that's one option. Um, it's not necessarily the best option, um, but that is one. And then you don't have to buy a, you know, like the, the stand. Um, but uh, you can buy like a mobile base for, you know, tools and equipment that should work or bare minimum, you can like just, hmm, I'm trying to think. Okay, some of it depends on what you want to turn, I think. If you're gonna be putting heavier stuff on there, you don't really just want to have it on this like random mobile wheelie base. Um, so I was just kind of thinking of other alt if I can think of like another alternative that's temporary, you know, like or on demand wheels. I don't know. Yep, this is a resin for mainly focused on like pen turning stuff. This blank is made out of resin. So if you go back to last week, uh, we did a dirty pour. Uh, but if you're looking for like pouring resin on a canvas, that is not what we do here. Mostly wood turning focused. Um, and then every once in a while I kind of dabble with other other things here and there like I've done not not like an actual table but like a, a the kind of resin river type things I've made a shelf um, I've done some cast in place things like pyramids and all that kind of good stuff but for the most part we we mostly focus on pens and other types of turning scenarios All right, so we got 1,000 grit here. And again, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this. I'm not like jamming it up in there. Keeping contact, you know, but you don't need to over press. Let the, let the sandpaper do the work and you'll be good to go. And it looks like, I think we're, I think we're, one thing that could have kind of altered the results, it looks like, it feels like the brass tube is kind of showing through on this one like quite a bit. So there's that. Didn't think about that. Oh, that is a bee. That's wonderful. A wasp. I don't like that. One bit. Anyway, he's busy looking at the light above me, so hopefully he'll just stay there. All right, so I think we're good to go here. Did I do the lengthwise thing? Let me just do a little bit of length. I don't want that. I don't want it on. Yeah, I think I did, but we'll just do a little bit more if I forgot. Okay. Then we'll pull out our handy dandy new magic juice uh cradle six pack look at this i'm gonna i'm gonna zoom out so you guys can see the action take place before your eyes I'll tell you what what this thing's gonna do here for me all right, so again, if you if you missed it, Mark made this for me. Oh, it's shaking. Quit shaking. The little magic juice holder. And like I said, it's got a magnet on the bottom, so you can just plop it. Um, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to put put it on the the other side because I actually like to cover the bed with my sham wow. <laughs> I just don't want to have to mess with the um, you know, cleaning polish off. I'm going to get this thing going about 1500 RPMs or so. And, oh, I got it backwards. 
Turn it around, we got step one, and I, and I got them kind of like set up here where I got one, two, three, four, five, six, so it's easy to easy to see what's going on. Uh, the one thing I'm gonna do is go and grab some, I like to use the blue shop towels uh, rather than those white ones, the, the bounty, I think is what it's called, bounty paper towels. Um, I just find that the, the blue ones are a little bit less abrasive, honestly. And so like for probably like steps one through three, probably not a big deal, but when you start getting up above that, I think that, you know, you may end up with, with certain, you know, like, like the bounty paper towels and stuff, <laughs> you may be abrading it, you know, like the paper towel may be probably more abrasive than the, the polish that you're putting on. <laughs> so that's not really helping you a whole lot. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly how that all factors in, but I do know that it, you know, it could. That's for sure. Yeah, go ahead and ask questions. You're limited to two questions, though. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I, I sanded 600 and then I did uh, 1,000 grit. I don't think you really need to go a whole lot higher. I mean, you could go to like 1500 or 2000. I actually think the magic juice instructions might even tell you to go up to 2000. Do I have those instructions? I used to have them. Here they are. So I kept this. Let's see here. Oh, I'm not. Let's get the camera back where it goes. Hold on a minute. I gotta do some adjustments here. There we go. Now we're good. Uh, let's see here. What do the directions say? They recommend wet sanding up to 2000 grit. And then it says, however, stopping at 800 grit is acceptable. So, you know. Um, the one thing that I differ from, they, they recommend like spinning up your lathe to like 2,400 to 3,000 RPMs. I just don't really think that's necessary. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. And they say polished sanded item with mild pressure for 20 to 60 seconds. I don't know. I'm sure there's a few different ways of doing this that, that all work. Uh, let's see here. Got a one to three ratio epoxy resin a few days ago. I'm making guitar picks, but each one has been bendy. Yeah, you're probably gonna have to wait like seven days. Um, it's probably an epoxy. Um, I would wait, see how they turn out i mean it may not get super hard like you may need to find a specific resin uh for something that's going to turn out thin like that but um the thing is the thinner the smaller the piece of resin is like if, if you made like so for instance let's compare a guitar pick to if you dumped 32 ounces of resin in a cup like this let me let me zoom out all right, so that's a huge chunk of resin, okay? This is gonna cure faster than a guitar pick. Um, it just, it's not generating as much heat being so small and thin things, you know, plastics aren't particular, like thermoplastics typically are not um, particularly um, strong. You know, they, they don't have as much tensile strength as like wood. So uh, you may need to find something that's a little bit harder, um, but I would definitely recommend waiting a little bit and see if it hardens up first. If not, you may need to kind of, uh, you know, contact some resin companies and, and see what, you know, wh which one they recommend for doing that kind of thing.
Yeah, it, I don't know. If you can find somebody who makes those, who does exactly the same type of thing, at least, at least bare minimum, the same size of type of thing, um, and see what resin they use, I would just, this is one of those cases where a lot of times it's better to just go with what somebody else, what, what works already for somebody else. Uh, you know, like, and I'm talking about like a resin, you know, brand and, and like formula. Uh, rather than you having to try a bunch of different stuff, if there's something that just works for that specific application, then just use that. The other nice thing about doing things like that, so like if you're going to make pen blanks and you're watching, you know, my channel, you know, a lot of people are just going to go with what I use um, for two reasons, because it works, obviously. And then the other thing is you can ask that person, you know, hey, I'm running into this issue. Have you ever seen this before? Um, it you know, I'm not saying that everybody's going to be willing to help <laughs> necessarily. It's not a guarantee, but you're a lot more likely if you're going with a resin that is specifically like a, a lot of people. Uh, there probably aren't that many people, like tons of people out there making guitar picks that you can kind of, you know, find. But something similar. Um, if you can go with a resin that lots of people are using and getting good results with, that might help out a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a, I have a good recommendation for that. Problem is, I don't exactly know what properties, what all properties you, you really need for that kind of thing. So it's kind of hard to give a recommendation. All right, so number two. Number two always wants to grab. I don't know what the deal is with it. Okay. Yeah, definitely wait. One thing you can do to, to help accelerate cure times is to uh, heat it up. Um, the thing is, you're going to probably, you know, it depends on the resin, I would say, but. If you got a little toaster oven um, or have access to something similar to, like that, um, if you can heat it up at like maybe 180 degrees Fahrenheit for, let's say, oh, I screwed that up, uh, for like, I don't know how long. It, it Each resin, you know, like the manufacturer probably has recommendations on this kind of stuff. They call it, it's called post curing. Um, but you can basically heat it up for, you know, like eight hours or something like that at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once you let it cool down, it, it should be harder. Um, it's it just, it's a good way to accelerate, you know, getting to that final cure. One thing that I do recommend, I'm not, I'm not sure which resin you're using, but it, it, I do, even though it's going to cost a little bit more, I think it's a good idea to go with a pretty well-known reputable resin brand especially one that has you know multiple different types of resin like um, you know stone coat or um, smooth on alumilite um, I don't know total boat that's another good one go with something where you know number one they've got a lot of different resins for you to choose from but they also have a phone number for you to call um, and then ask them, you know, hey, I'm doing this project. What resin out of your line do you recommend would work best? You know, I know everybody wants to save money, but uh, sometimes it's not really worth saving some money. And and another issue is sometimes, you know, if you just randomly buy resin that's some no-name whatever, even if it is a name brand, if you buy it on like Amazon or some random seller where products basically just sit in a warehouse until somebody actually orders them uh, what can happen is you're buying resin that's already out of its uh you know like sh uh, the the shelf date whatever it's it's already kind of been sitting there and, and like old and sometimes you know they, they there is a shelf life to resin so it's good to either i, I typically recommend going for something that is a name brand you know a, a brand that people use 
and then also buying it from a, a source that that moves you know that sells a lot of resin so either buying it directly from the from the manufacturer or um, from a you know hobby store or you know I, I don't know if there's resin stores necessarily but yeah I mean I if you can find like a resin focused store um, that's big they're going to be moving a lot of units and they're not going to be pulling out stuff that's already been sitting on the shelf for a year uh, resins only have a shelf life typically of like six to eight months and so if it's been sitting in a warehouse for six months already you know you're buying old resin so just just a random tip and i don't know what your situation is what resin you got but um, I like to mention these these things. Uh, you know, there's reasons. It's not just because you know I'm I've been you know working with Alumalite for a while that I recommend it. It's just there's reasons, <laughs> that, you know, to to go with. And I'm not saying Alumalite is what you need to go with, but um, you know, to, you know, some name brand, some bigger brand that you know, yes, is going to cost a little bit more, but there are advantages to doing that. I just like being able to call a company if I run into problems with their resin because um, I'd rather have answers than replacement, you know. A lot of times their tech department can kind of help out, go through some stuff if you have any issues. Oh, there you go. Yeah, if you can find a store and talk to people, it, it really does help. You know, I have general knowledge, um, you know, th like the basics. I can talk about how to work with resins and stuff, and it's not going to ma matter if you're making guitar picks or resin tables for the most part. Or, you know, I can give you kind of basic information, but if you're, but it, it really helps to talk to somebody who's kind of doing the same things <clears throat> to really, you know, know, okay, well, this resin is really good for this you know or here's a technique that you can use um, to get like better results so that's awesome all right so here's the reveal guys like i said i think i should have painted the tube it's a little bit see-through <laughs> whoops all right so let's see if we can get a decent shot of this it was kind of dark or something might have to just pick it up and there we go that's a little better. It'll focus. I can't tell if it's focusing or not because I can't see. So what we have here, it worked. Um, I just screwed up kind of because I didn't use a painted tube. I just grabbed the tubes that were in there. But you can see. I mean, that's that that's that's a good shot of it. Like it's. I think it worked. It's just very see through. So if we would have gone with like a black backdrop, I think we would have gotten a much better result. <laughs> I think next time, so I'm gonna go and look. I would say next time more mica powder would be a very good thing. Let's see what we did. I went with less because I knew that we were going to a higher temperature. And sometimes when you put more mica powder in, it just thickens up already. So I, I, I don't know, let's see, what did we do? We, we waited till 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, it was relatively uh, on the cooler side, let's say, not, not cold, but 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the shop. We poured at 110 and I only used a quarter teaspoon per 100 grams of resin. So a quarter teaspoon of the powder per 100 grams of resin in each one of these colors. And I think I should probably have doubled the amount of mica powder. And I'm not entirely certain that that 110 degrees is like super important. Like I think we could drop it down to maybe like 105 maybe even still get away with 110. Um, the problem is, you know, the longer you wait, the more thick it's going to be and the harder it's going to be to pour. You know, you're starting to kind of run out of time possibly. But I think we could have adjusted some of those numbers. And I think this would have worked a little bit better. So I think we're going to get kind of similar results on this one. I'm not certain that I really even want to assemble that pen because it 
kind of sucks. <laughs> Gonna be honest. Right. And it's it's like I said, it's just mainly because I should have painted the tube. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see. I don't know if I want to waste the pen kit on that one though. I can disassemble it, but I don't think I'll be selling that pen. Um, let's let's get this thing out of my way here. So number two is what we're working on here. Make sure that we got everything set up. Let's see, is there any other questions here? Yeah, Lumalite's got good customer service. I think Total Boat does too, as far as I can tell. Um, I, I haven't used their products, just, I just, whatever. <laughs> I don't need to, Alumalite's got every kind of resin that I could ever want, so I, I've just kind of stuck with them because I've been dealing with them for, you know, over a decade. So it's easier for me to just kind of stick with something. And, and there's a lot of people that are using Total Boat that, you know, if you want questions about, if you have questions about Total Boat specifically, I just kind of say, go talk to Doug. <laughs> He's, he knows, and there's a lot of other people. And Stone Coat too, they've got a lot of people using their products. Um, I have used a few Stone Coat products, but um, they're all relatively the same, but you know, it is good to get a company. And I've used Smooth On products, they're all right. I don't really love their customer service personally. Um, I haven't had particularly amazing results with them, but um, lots of people use Smooth On. It's a pretty big company, so that's a good one. So yeah, lots of, lots of different options out there. And there's even more. There's, you know, like uh, I know uh, J Diction. Um, uh, Steve McDonald uses a lot of their stuff, um, which, you know, that's, uh, I don't know if uh, Zeus is still here, but um, if you search for Steve McDonald, He's done a lot. He, I think his channel would be a little bit more up your alley. Um, he doesn't make like guitar picks specifically, but he does a lot more things like that with resins that would be pretty suitable for that. And he has a lot more knowledge about those products. So um, definitely check him out, Steve Mc McDonald. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think, Just Resin. Uh, I think they got decent products. Uh, I believe Ben over at Ben's Works uses some Just Resin products, and obviously he gets really good results too with his stuff. Yeah, I'm a little bummed I didn't go for a painted tube. And I, th I think, you know, like I said, twofold. I really think that it needed more mica powder. Interesting though, you get really interesting um, you know, when you when you move this thing, it really shifts weirdly. It's pretty unimpressive if you just look straight on, but then you can get some like really cool chatoyants on angles, which I think is kind of telling me that had I gone for more mica powder, I think these would have been a lot cooler. <laughs> so, eh, you can't win them all. Uh, the mermaid blanks, I, yeah, actually, that's probably going to be the next uh, project. Um, I think I want to turn a, well, actually, it's not, so um, I'll give you guys a little bit of a, I'm going to go over and talk to the camera. I just feel like it's, I'd rather feel like I'm actually talking to you guys than just kind of staring at that pen blank not moving. So um, some exciting news. Uh, I've decided to also, and this is not a big deal. It's not, it's just, I, I wanted to separate the pens that I make because eventually I do want to start selling, especially some of the custom pens, but I don't want to be like, it's a resin work studio pen. I just didn't like that. I wanted to have like a pen company kind of thing. That's, that's like separate, like a separate Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I have been like obsessing over what, not obsessing, but like, I just could not decide on a like a, a name for, for like the pen company side of things. I had a lot of ideas, I just didn't know which way to go. And I finally um, settled, uh, not, not settled, I've, I've finally decided on what I'm gonna call it. <clears throat> so I live up near Tahoe and this was actually the first idea that I had uh, out of all of them. Um, but I, I kind of like Tahoe Pen Company. It just, I, I really love Tahoe, it's a beautiful area. And uh, it gives me a lot of ideas if I, if I ever wanted to come out with different um, like, like types. Like right now, I'm still just kind of like, I make a three-piece pen and like that's it. Um, they may have some slight differences or whatever, but 
down the road, you know, I may decide to actually have like models where, you know, very specific details to, to different pens. We'll see. I don't know. That's just, you know, it, it leaves the door open for that kind of thing. Um, but with, with like the Tahoe theme, there's all kinds of cool stuff that I could like name different lines and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's going to be the name of like the pen company side of things. And I'm going to start getting things kind of going on that. Um, and I got a logo, uh, actually when I was down at, at Turner's warehouse, Chad helped me kind of, um, settle in on a, like a logo design for it. So I got some ideas and I'm pretty excited about that side of things. I'm not going to, it's, I'm not like stopping making blanks or, or focusing on pens. It's literally going to be like the same type of thing, but I'm, you know, I'll probably be a little bit more inclined to make more pens just randomly here and there. And then, you know, put them up for, you know, on, on like, you know, I'll probably have like a website and all that kind of stuff, bare minimum, an Instagram and actually sell pens. Um, I'm feeling pretty confident with the kit list stuff at this point. I don't think that there's anything wrong with selling them. Um, they, they work very good. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the cool thing. I'm, I'm really excited, but so the mermaid pen, I want to make one of those really bad, but, um, I need to get nibs engraved. Um, now that I have a logo and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to have nibs engraved. And the other thing that I want to do, and I haven't actually even done any of these, so I got to kind of play with it, but I want to put one of those little disc insignia things on the finial. Um, I think that would, I don't know, just little, little minor touches. I'm not going to get super fancy with my pens or anything, but, um, at least as of now, they're going to still be pretty simple, like kind of three piece designs. Um, but a couple other makers that I admire, um, do this lot, lots of other ones do. Um, and I always kind of wanted my own little logo thing at the top. So this is the uh, atelier. Let me get my let me get on the camera this is the atelier luso i don't know if that's even working <laughs> i can't get it to can't get in the center either oh come on anyway there's a logo thing in the, <laughs> in the cap <laughs> this camera's not working not at all i just cannot get this to work Uh, it's almost visible. So anyway, you can put a little thing in the in the finial or like the top of your cap that has a little bit of logo going on. So I'm gonna probably have some of those made. I'm gonna get some. Um, one thing that I really like is the if if you make pens and one of the things that you're always struggling with is like the sleeves or how to like ship them. Um, you know, that kind of thing. I used to put them in little baggies, little velvet sacks, and then there's like pen, little pen case things or plastic things. One of the coolest things, it's a big deal. Um, a lot of people in the, the custom like fountain pen, um, market, um, they buy from a, a company called rickshaw bags and they're like neoprene sleeves. They are sick. Um, I'm going to drop a link to this. You guys should check this out because I'm definitely going to be having them make make me some stuff. So they can do like, you know, screen printing on these like neoprene sleeve things. I don't know how much they cost. I don't really care. I think it's totally worth it, especially if you're going to be selling like the, the customs, the, the kind of higher end stuff. Um, definitely check that out because they work really great. They, they You can get different length sizes depending on what you're making, but they really do protect the pen. That's what is awesome about that company. And they're like super supportive of the pen turning community. Um, and they have all kinds of other different stuff that they make. They, they make like, like full on pen cases and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's really cool. They, they, they make, and neoprene might actually be the wrong material. I don't know exactly what it is, but go check them out. It's pretty cool. So different kind of stuff. So I just wanted to kind of give you a little heads up. We're, we're, I'll be doing some some cool stuff down the road here soon. Uh, hopefully I can get those nibs engraved soon and then we can get on that mermaid pen. Selfishly, I just want to make one and then post it on Instagram because I think everybody's going to be like, oh my God, I need 10 of those. Because that's how I feel about them. I love those mermaid blanks. It's my crowning achievement. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Kid Cooper. Yeah, I wonder where he's at. <clears throat> so I'm pretty excited about it, like I said. Tahoe Pen Company. I just that it just felt it felt right from the beginning, actually. The reason that I didn't just do it and I was like thinking of different other different names. Honestly, it was because I was worried about creating, I had an idea for a logo, but I was like, I don't think I can make that myself. Um, I'm gonna have to pay like an artist. And, and I had other ideas where the logo would have been so simple and easy that it was almost stupid. But I, I finally kind of decided actually, like I said, Chad and Amy actually really helped me secure that and, and like come up with it. And, and like I said, Chad actually made the logo, which was pretty cool. And it was super simple, like, he didn't do anything spectacular, he's not like a graphic artist, we were just in Canva, and he's like, how about this? And we tried a couple different things, and like, one of them was like, perfect, exactly what I had in mind, and I was like, sweet! So, it's pretty fun. Alright, I'm just gonna leave these on, um, you typically don't really want to leave gloves on when you're turning, because, you know, it can get caught up in the thing and, and whatever, but with, with just a rubber glove, it's, it'll rip if, if anything caught or anything like that, so I'm not not particularly dangerous just keep your hands out uh, but never wear like like a fabric glove something that's not going to rip very easily don't ever do that on a lathe that's super dangerous <clears throat> i just don't want to have to waste a pair of nitrile gloves i'm going to put them back on for sanding And if anybody's like wondering why am I wearing gloves, like you really don't need gloves to wet sand. It just, it ends up drying out my hands and my cuticles are super dry anyway. So that's why I do that. I mean, frankly, it's almost to the point where I almost want to wear gloves when I do the dishes. A buddy of mine is a dentist and he actually does that. <laughs> Pulls out some gloves when he does the, the dishes. And at first I was like, that's kind of crazy. And then I started thinking about it. And I'm like, well, that's pretty much why my hands are all messed up half the time. Especially when you live in a dry climate. That doesn't help at all. When we go on vacation to places that are more humid, I don't really have that problem. So I'm going to leave this one a little bit thicker in the middle. It's going to be kind of ridiculous, like I wouldn't probably make a pen like this, but what I want to do is try and get, you know, the, the thicker you leave the, the blank, the more resin is left, right? And so I'm just going to make this really bulbous so that we can hopefully get a better idea of what the actual resin looks like in here rather than just kind of seeing through it, you know.
I'm gonna try to give it a little bit longer of a ramp on one end compared to the other also. Or a taper, I should say, like a longer taper. Yeah, it's a little bit longer, I don't know. Okay, I think that's good. Like I said, I think these are gonna go in the... This is what happens when you don't paint your tube pile. This one's looking better. This one's definitely looking better. It's de and it's actually, it's a lot different too. Huh. I'm gonna take it down just a little bit because this thing's still pretty. I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that this is not really what's, what the, the resin looks like on the inside. Like, I, I don't know. We got this huge green blob. We got a huge uh, bronze. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit more off of this because it doesn't. It just doesn't seem like it's as transparent as the other one. And I, I honestly I don't really know why. Let's see what that looks like now. Took a little bit more off. Hey, Barb, how's it going? <laughs> no, not that pile. <laughs> well, this one's looking all right, actually. But the first one, eh, it's it's honestly, it's, it's pretty, it's not good. I should have painted the tube. And I was saying that, you know, I used about a quarter teaspoon of mica powder for each color per 100 grams of resin. And it just really wasn't enough. I was trying to keep it a little bit more thin. Like it looks good if you're angling it way down, but like straight on, that's, I mean, that's what, that's what I'm seeing when I look at it straight on. It's, it's just, you can see the tube. It's very see-through, not good, not particularly good. This one, I'm going to leave a little bit thicker. There's still that green blob. Interesting. So I think that's probably pretty good. I'm not, I don't need to. I'm gonna do a little bit more taper work on this one. Okay, let's do some sanding. Let's get it done. Ah. Oh. It's so nice when you turn the dust collector off. I love the dust collector and I hate the dust collector because I don't really like how loud it is, but I like that it pulls all that dust out of my face. It's nice. Yeah, this might be one of the, you know, I was talking about that. 
looking at all the different blanks. Um, so there might be people that didn't catch the, the beginning part of this. Um, you'll kind of have have to. Have, oh, that's not the right thing. You will have to have seen what we actually did. But if you look at these blanks, like this one in particular, I mean that that doesn't look like at all. <laughs> like this where there's like lots of thin lines and what I was saying is when you when I was pouring it like the first one the colors were a lot more like I'm thinking this was the first pour maybe that one that I'm turning as well um, and then as as I poured more and more resin out it was starting to get where the colors were just like it was like super thin bands and I was like man I don't know these are looking kind of muddy and that's what a lot of these look like. And then I also screwed up and, and totally mixed all the blanks together. So I don't know which was the first and second batch because we did them slightly different. But I, at this point, I don't really think it would have turned out that much different. But you got a couple that have that seem to be a little bit more, I don't know, like spread out or whatever. Eh, that one's not so much. That one's kind of the same. But like two or three... Here's another one where there's some kind of different stuff going on. I I don't know, and I just randomly picked a couple out of the out of the pile to turn today. Uh, and I, I go back to the beginning because I kind of mentioned a couple ideas that I have for for maybe some other you know ideas to to get different results. I I just don't know exactly. I don't know. I, I think that you can use the dirty pour method. I think there's got to be a way to use that where you can just kind of pour it all at once and get some pretty cool, you know, you're not going to make them look like swirly uh, or anything. Like I, I still think if you're looking for like, you know, kind of swirls of color, you really need to dump one, you know, one after the other um, like I normally do. But I think you could get some pretty cool looking results doing it with the dirty pour method I just don't I haven't figured out the technique yet you know got to be a technique uh, one thing that may play into it also is color choice um, these were all fairly dark colors uh, silver isn't like dark but that's really not showing up anywhere I mean a little bit I can see some here and there I mean it, it kind of shows up that got kind of like it's the, the contrast isn't really there besides the green that bronze and red they, they kind of mix together a little bit more so i don't know I, I think that if you had good contrast maybe even less colors like two colors may work better for this i don't know there's so many different ways you can do this that <laughs> it's going to take a while if i ever figure it out And sometimes, sometimes I never figure it out. Although, there, in some cases, sometimes you just need to table something. You know, um, I might try this again one more time. Um, like I said, I, I, I have some ideas that I think would make a difference. Um, I don't know if it would be amazing results, but I think you would get different results than what we're getting right here. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if... if you done like two or three, four, four different things and it's nothing's working. Sometimes you just got to put it aside, come back to it, you know, wait, wait for some inspiration. Maybe someone else does something that you see that you're like, oh, that might work for that thing that I was trying to do, you know. I'm trying to think that happened to me sometime recently where I was like trying and trying and like just... I could not get this to work, and I was like, whatever, I'm done. And I'm talking like it was like eight years ago, like eight or seven or eight years ago. And I just set it aside forever, and then I, I came back to it, and it just, I don't know, for some reason, like nothing, I didn't even get an idea, I don't think. I was just like, I'm going to try this again, and like the first shot, it, it worked. <laughs> and I was like, sweet. I don't know what was different. Oh, swap camera view. Thanks for letting me know. What, that's not exciting, looking at those blanks? <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of excitement going on wet sanding anyway, though. You didn't miss anything.
So again, I'm, I'm starting with 600 grit, um, the wet dry, you know, silicon carbide style paper. I'm really fine, I'm, I'm really, I think this is the way to go, guys. Finding it works. I used to use Abernet. And I mean, it worked, it, there's nothing wrong with it or anything. It, tons of people use this, but you can see that the, the particles are, are very spread out. They have to be, it's a, it's a screen. Whereas like the particles on something like this, the, you know, the black one, they're like, there's, there's many more of them. And I, I just, I think that wet sanding with silicon carbide is really the way to do resins. And I'm starting, I used to start at 400 grit with the Abernet and 600 seems to be just fine. I would say under, you know, I don't think the conditions have changed. Like the surface isn't getting better for some reason now. I think it's just strictly the sandpaper because there's literally more little grit particles doing the work. So we, uh, last night we watched uh, Mission Impossible 2. Um, with the, the new one came out, you know, whatever, last year or something like that. Uh, and now it's it's free on Paramount Plus. So, But I wanted to watch all the Mission Impossible movies again. There's like five other ones or six. And so we watched number two. And man, I, I got to be honest, it was pretty cheesy. Like the action scenes were like so over the top and like ridiculous. It was great. Has anybody watched the number two lately? <clears throat> Where, where am I? I'm not sure what you mean, Paul. Oh. The camera view, probably. Oh, you're excited to see the, like, the, the line patterns well the thing is like there's there's line patterns in this one the problem is i just screwed up and there's not enough mica and i should have painted the tube like this one i think would have given you i mean i know it would have if if the mica was standing out more you have lines in there like it would have been kind of cool i just messed up um and i didn't really mess up the pour the nice thing is i can make another one um, which here's actually so we're gonna have to turn more pens next week okay so i'm like talking about this like it's the tragedy and we're just gonna move on but here's the deal guys if i don't think i need to redo that one but uh it should be this blank i mean really i could use any blank but i actually have the other half of the first one right here and so if i just i want to see what this looks like with a painted tube you know so definitely not going to assemble that other one because I don't like it either. This one has some, uh, I don't know, some, this one could be kind of cool looking. But I do think we're going to have to wait until we actually uh, pol start polishing this for it to maybe really shine. Sometimes once you start polishing it, that's when you realize that you should have painted the tube makes the light kind of goes through it a little bit better one thing if, if you didn't if your colors are vibrant enough um, and you want to hide the tube a little bit if, if it'll work sometimes you might be able to just get away with sanding up to like 2000 and uh, you know going for like that that kind of not matte but like a satin finish where you're not you know not high gloss that might help refract the light enough to not show the, the tube as much. So just, just something to think about. You can maybe try it. I mean, it's not like, not like it's going to take longer, you know, much longer to just sand to 2000, see if that works. If it doesn't work, then just polish it out, you know? All right, so let's stop and let's take a look at this. Yeah, like this one looks pretty cool with this satin kind of finish. You can definitely see the tube down at the ends. That's for sure. Yeah, you can see it even there, really. I don't know. 
Should have painted the tubes, guys. This is what I always tell I always tell everybody. I'm like, just paint it. What's the, you know? You're gonna be mad when you don't paint it, and you should have. That's what I am right now. You know what's funny is I can actually I, I just wasn't looking at it. Like I can see the actual camera view on my phone. I just wasn't I just get so focused, guys, you know? Talking and Doing this sanding, getting focused on the sanding. I don't know where I am. I'm just like, whatever. What, you can't see? What do you mean? Okay, that ought to be good enough. Do a little bit of lengthwise. This. Okay, wipe it off. So this is at a thousand grit. Let's take a look at this and see. Can you guys see? It's okay. It's not the best pen I've ever made. But you definitely get some interesting, like, mixtures. You know, this one, again, this one's a little bit different, and I don't know exactly what's going on. It's probably, I, I do think it was probably more one of the first pours of one of the batches. But there's, you know, there's definitely the silver and the bronze mixed in here, and you can, I see some red some green like it, the problem is i really needed to put more mica powder in this like twice as much probably um i think that would have been a lot better brian woodward with the ten dollars thanks man uh brian's thinking about upgrading the harbor freight pot to a five gallon ca pot um i would get i would definitely not get a ca technologies at this point um i would get a california air tools so hopefully that's what you meant um in the past i've i've really touted in a lot of the pots that i use like the sil silver ones uh which i can kind of show you just just so everybody kind of knows what's what's going on here i'm going to go over here uh, to this one no not that one the intro cam all right so these are the CA Technologies pots, and they're excellent, but they're way overpriced. And I have a five-gallon CA Technologies. I want to say these things cost like $700 at this point. Not worth it. That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm pretty sure I paid four or 500 and I think that even that was ridiculous. Um, the blue ones, these are the California Air Tools. Um, these are excellent. Um, same quality, slightly different looking. This one's a little bit taller. This one's a little bit wider and shorter, but... Um, same quality as the CA technologies for like half the price. Um, and these come fully ready out of the box. You just plug in your, you know, air hose and you're, you're good to go. Um, so I would recommend getting the California air tools. Um, the, let's see, what was the question? The, is there any, any drawback to a large pot? Um, the, the lid, it, it's heavier, it's, it's clunkier. Um, it's harder maybe well, maybe a little harder to like mount if you're going to do that and eh, not really but could be a little bit um my biggest problem is the lids are heavier um it, they just they don't go on and, and um tighten down as fast um i guess well actually that's another thing uh let's see if for some reason you're really running up against the clock, um, and, and the reason I say this is I use a resin called Illumilite White, which literally has a two minute working time. I will never use a five gallon pot with that resin because I'm literally, it's starting to kind of set up when I'm putting it in a smaller pot. And the reason that this is important is because it's gonna take twice as long to fill this pot as it will a two and a half with air. 
to get up to, to pressure. So the beauty of these though, is they work, you know, if you wanna do larger items, uh, bowls or, you know, whatever, or just bigger things, more things, you know, this is gonna work just fine. It's gonna work the same. It'll, it'll handle anything that you would have put in the two and a half gallon. Um, but it'll also handle things that you can only fit in a five. So it's a great value. Um, I always recommend, it just, what I find, especially for a lot of us pen turners and stuff, you're doing stoppers, handles. The thing is like 85% of what we wanna do, if you're the same as me, is gonna fit in a two and a half gallon. And I just think it's so much easier to get the, you know, the lid on and everything. And it's just, I would much prefer using a two and a half personally. However, there's no way that I would get rid of a five. So if you have the budget, <laughs> I recommend getting a two and a half and a five, um, which you already have a Harbor Freight. So I think if you're gonna get something else, I would probably go with the five. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with the Harbor Freight, but you're gonna love upgrading to a California Air Tools. They're just class of their own kind of thing compared to a Harbor Freight. So I think, uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, let's see here. Oh, silicone emery, yeah. Yeah, that stuff, the emery stuff is better for metal for sure. Um, it probably works okay. The thing is, I, I don't know. I don't know that I would recommend the emery paper and I don't think that you really wanna be using that on a lathe particularly because that stuff doesn't rip um, as, as easy. I, I don't know, it's just, it's un unnecessary. It probably costs more than just regular wet dry, but it definitely would sand, all right. Yeah, Paul, yeah, you just upgraded to the California. They're awesome. Um, and I'm so happy that they finally came in because they've had the five gallon out for, for many years, I think at this point. But like nobody had a cheap solution for a two and a half gallon pot that was good. Harbor Freight is fine. And then there was CA Technologies, but these things were getting, I mean, even the two and a half is like, I don't know how much they cost, but I can't possibly recommend anybody buy these, the, the California, or I'm sorry, the CA Technologies ones. They're so ridiculous. Um, this is perfect. Um, and the other thing is these cost a ton, the, the, Calif or the, the CA Technologies, this costs way more than this one and it still doesn't come ready to go out of the box like it just it's a no-brainer with these things so i love it when they came out with the two and a half i'm like sweet and i made chad i was like you're gonna send me one because <laughs> i am happy and i i want to share this so if you're gonna pick one up head, head over to turner's warehouse i got a link in the description to those um they're excellent excellent pressure pots and frankly obviously I don't need to get another one, but, and I don't use the five gallon that much, but I actually want to get a California air tools five gallon, just because I want to get that thing out of my shop. Like I don't want to even recommend somebody look at that one um, because there's absolutely no advantage to that CA technologies five gallon. The one difference between CA technologies and California air tools that, that I, it's not notable, but it, there is a difference. You can technically go up to, like a working pressure of 80 psi in the in the ca technologies technically that's what it says on the lid um, compared to 60 for working pressure in the the california air tools but the difference between 60 and 80 is nothing so um, 60 is plenty for everything that i've ever done um, so you won't have to worry about that okay i think we were done right i don't know I think we did a thousand already so let's uh and we got our our magic juice oh i love this container mark thanks man check it out guys the magic juice if you haven't seen it the magic juice container from mark Thing's awesome okay so let me get my step one in front and it's got a magnet on the bottom so i just click it onto my lathe and got my bottles i like to keep my uh I keep putting it away, but I, I like to keep that uh, my sham wow. It doesn't, it's just more of a joke. I actually found that you could buy sham wow still, so I was like, I'm gonna buy some. So anyway, that's just to cover cover the bed. I just don't have to clean it later. Uh, let's get this speed going. Get number one ready. Oh, I gotta go get some more. Uh, I like to use the blue paper towels shop towels from Scott. 
Scott brand. Seemed to work pretty good. I just kind of rip it into quarters and then into little pieces and then it'll work pretty good in here. Okay. Step one, where'd it go? I lost it. Step one. Yeah, so actually, Brian, uh, Brian Woodward, what, what types of projects do you do? I mean, that's the, I think that's the biggest question. Um, with like the size of, of pressure pot, like, what do you do? You, are you thinking about doing things like bowls or, or taller, like a, a pepper mills? Um, Because if that's the case, then you definitely want to going to want to get a larger five gallon. But if if you're talking about like pen blanks and stuff, I don't know. Uh, it's going to cost more. It'll let you do larger things if you decide to do that. But if you really have no plans to do that, then I don't know. I think the two and a half is kind of the way to go. Yeah, the, the the setups on because I had to do that with all the CA Technologies ones, and my and I have a bunch of Harbor Freight ones, two or th maybe three, and you had to like do a bunch of plumbing. It's not hard, honestly, but I'll tell you what: pulling a thing out of a box and plugging it in, <laughs> like way easier nowadays um, the only setting that you actually have to do i did do a little bit of plumbing because i actually wanted um, i think they come the california air tools i think it has like a 90 degree fitting like like you would you would hook the air hose from sideways but mine is hung my air hose is hung from the ceiling so i did do a little bit of plumbing i just swapped out to make that uh you know the the hose valve thing whatever um where it's just going straight up out of the pot. Uh, but that was unnecessary. I didn't have to do that. I just wanted it that way. And then um, the only other thing that you got to do on those is set the, uh, the regulator, which literally takes two seconds. So, I mean, just no time at all. But, you know, when you have to do all the plumbing, I mean, there's a significant chance that you could get leaks here and there and I don't know it just it was it I mean it was a good it was gonna take you a while like I mean there's a there was some messing around that you had to do I don't know how long it really took me to set them up but the plumbing didn't take that long it was just then you had to see where where the leaks and this and that and eh. not, not not fun that's for sure All right, so we're on to number three. I'm telling you guys, this is great with this little container thing. What do you call this? Whatever it's called. This, this thing's awesome. I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to back out. Let's see. Can I zoom out a little bit more? I'm just going to show you like how this works. This is so great. I used to have the bottles like lined up, they'd fall off my lathe. It was it was such a pain. And then I'd have to like pick up. I could usually only carry like three at a time, so I'd be like that because I, I I leave them over not by the not right by the lathe. It'd be nice if I had some. It'd be smarter if I stored them somewhere closer. But you know, I don't really want these things the the polish to be by the lathe when it's when I'm making a bunch of dust either. So look at that. I know that that wasn't really, but you'll see on the next step. It's so great. You just pull it out and I got it set up where I got one in the front. So I know exactly what my, you know, which, which bottle I need at what time. That's the one thing about these. The only one, you know, for sure, or the two, you know, that the brown one or the, the kind of yellowish one is number two. 
and then this one's gray you know just looking at the top of the bottle i don't know what the, the label colors indicate or anything just looking at the stuff i mean this one's definitely always five because it's like gray that one's yellow so it's number two but the rest of them are all white so you have no clue which one's which i would literally have to pick it up look at the label every single time now i don't have to do that i don't know what step we're on number four i think sounds good See, look at this. Number four. I know exactly where it is. Squeeze it out. Put it back. Look at that. And to be honest, guys, this design with the six-pack style, like two rows of three, uh, I had one. I had a little holder for that that stadium pen blanks the maker of magic juice sells and i'll show you how that works it's a long thing and that's fine but it's not i i like this better I, it's it's easier for me it doesn't take up as much room you know it's compact so i like it So are you taking, you are taking orders on these, right, Mark? Make sure to contact Mark if you want one. Yeah, you could, I, that's that's a good thought, Mark. You know, like, because, I don't know, if for some reason, yeah. I think it'd be better, like, really, I mean, we can just grab a Sharpie and number them if, if you wanted to do that. I just don't even see the need because I know, I know, you know, I know how I have it set up to make sense in my brain. So, like, I don't really think numbers are, for me, would be helpful. Um it is kind of nice to be able to just do, you know, not be like stuck with whatever the person thought was the best. I don't know. Oh. Got a little out of control on that one. Number six. Okay. We did it. Bring you guys back into the into the mix here. Trying to get the light a little bit better, maybe. I don't know. We'll see if that works. Gotta have sound effects. Sound effects not included. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I'm much more impressed with this one. I don't know what the deal is. There's there's just better, more mica in it, it feels like. Whoa, super close. Back it up, back it up. Okay. That one's pretty good. Again, I mean, is this the pe best pen blank I've ever made? No. But if you use your head a little bit and think about, you know, like different colors and stuff, like, I don't know. I mean, I mean the, the dirty pour thing is cool. There definitely needs to be more. My, I mean, you can see the tube right there. Realistically, I mean, the, the green is really thin. You can really see the tube through that. So either way, it needed more mica powder for sure. But it's not too bad. This one's this one's not bad. It's it's kind of like I don't know. It, it feels like I don't know, fluffy or something. I don't know if that's the right word. 
it's pillowy uh, the way that it kind of turned out, especially with the, the bronze and, and silver. So I think I'm going to make a pen out of this one. Unfortunately, we're not going to... The idea was to go with, uh, um, to, you know, to put together the aluminum version of the... Uh, oh, that's the wrong one. You know, the aluminum version of the element and then also the, the stainless steel. Now, they're going to look the same pretty much, so uh, whatever. What I want to do is I want to feel the aluminum one because I just... It's, these components are so light. Like, it doesn't even feel like I'm holding anything with these. Compared to this, like, this is, you know, significant. Like, there, there's weight to this, um, which is good in some cases, but it's, I would say, more rare... This is so light that it's lighter than most pen kits. That that's how light it is. So let's let's pull out. I want to see how much it does a monarch or whatever. How much does a monarch weigh? So I think that that's that's I think maybe the the missing piece of information. So this was tw about twelve grams for the aluminum one. This was thirty one or so. And so here's just a, a, you know, like your standard like Sierra kit. You know what I mean? So it's two parts. I've left the the same parts. I, I didn't weigh the ink or the transmission thing. So here's the components on a normal Sierra. Again, that's like 30, right? <laughs> like that's like 30 grams. So it's much, you know, the stainless steel is a little heavier than a standard pen kit, but this is half the weight. Like. If you want a really light pen, the Element Series, and these are all Turner's Warehouse, in-house, like you can't get these anywhere else kind of thing. Um, in fact, I'm going to go get a, a, oh God, there's the wasp. Why, why is he, why you got to be buzzing by me, wasp? Get out of here. Yeah, no, just go away. Just go away. God. Hate bees. Um, sorry, I was thinking about, I was going to get you guys a, a link. I forgot to put that in the description because I forgot to set the thing up yesterday. So there he is buzzing around me again. I don't have to kill that bee. I hope you get electrocuted buzzing around in there. Yeah. Actually, it's not a wasp. Maybe it is. It actually might be a hornet. Um, let's see, Element Series Pen Kits. And they make these in, one thing that I forgot to mention, if you're not familiar with these, you really got to check them out. So um, the Element Series comes in the, like a Sierra style, they call that the Twist. There's a Cigar version and a Junior. And I think that's it. Yeah, those three. Uh, and it comes in aluminum, brass, copper, and stainless steel. And this is solid aluminum solid brass solid copper um, and with especially with the brass and the copper you can patina it and get really cool results so uh, let me get a link i'm just super excited i've, I've been kind of waiting to get like the like a really good um uh good um project idea sorry that b is like <laughs> got my attention a little bit um, so I've been waiting to do this for a while, um, and I thought this would be kind of cool. We can kind of look at the aluminum versus the stainless steel. Um, I'm more excited about the brass and the copper because of the, the actual patina thing. So let me, let me drop this. There we go. Oh, that, yeah, the, um, this is a Monarch. Um, again, this is an, also a Turner's Warehouse. It's like an oil spill kind of deal. Yeah, so that one's kind of tough, though. You got to have the right blank, and I haven't. That's why I haven't actually used that yet. You, you really kind of need, like, the right thing to go with that. Otherwise, it's just going to kind of clash.
Why does that bee have to just be hanging out above my head? Seriously. Okay, so I gotta go get my little uh, pen assembly tool thing. Pen press. Uh, pen press. So it's about a penway? I don't even know what that means. Penway. Ah, whoa. What the? Now he's dive bombing me. This guy's going to die. You're going to die, B. I don't I don't deal well with dive bombing bees. You're going to get denatured alcohol. Then you're going to get stomped on. Drunk B. I need a oh, perfect. There you go, you're dead. Son of a beach. <laughs> uh crack myself up. Okay, moving on. I've never actually assembled this kit, so we'll have to see what is going on here, how this works. Okay. I think I got, I think I figured out what's going on. So here's the kit components. Here's all the stuff that came in the bag. Okay, I'm going to kind of arrange this stuff the way that it kind of goes. Uh, whatever. Okay, so what, what we need to do, I believe... Uh, we need to screw this into this part, eventually. And then we would actually press this on. I think I'm going to... I don't know what the best way to... I don't know if it matters which way you do this. I think I'm going to assemble this thing first because I, I don't see why not. Right? So I'm just going to go for it. Didn't take much. I, you probably could have just pushed that thing on your <laughs> by hand. <laughs> so we got that part and then... This does come apart here. These are really nice threads. Um, here's another cool thing. I didn't notice this before. I don't know if it'll show up. I'm gonna try and zoom in here. Oh, for goodness. See that uh, detail on there? That's pretty cool. I don't know. Thought I'd share that. Okay, so... Hmm... I don't know which way to go. I kind of like... I really like this kind of fluffy pattern on the on the front. Where it's all kind of... I don't know. I don't know what how to... It's very Chateauans. <laughs> so I think I'm going to put the clip there. 
I just, I don't know. I, these long lines are, are interesting, but it, it, I don't know. Not as interesting, I don't think, to me. I like seeing this side of it, and you would more than likely be looking at it from the clip side. So that's the way we're going to do this. Still can't get over how light this kit is. It's really nice. Ooh, it's a little tight. A little bit tight, but I got it. Okay, and then oh, Get in there. Probably should have done the tip first. Oh, it's going in sideways. is happening here. There we go. All right. And then to put the ink in, you just unscrew the nib. Drop that guy in. Ooh, it works. That's pretty cool. I really like the, the mechanism. It's like a Gatsby mechanism, kind of. I think those had, like, where the, whatever, the finial. Oh, there's, there's also a detail on the back. That's cool. I didn't even see that either. This is a nice kit. I like that. Very light, though. I mean, I don't, uh, do I have any other Sierras? Must. Here's one. This was the Christmas one. Remember this one? So here's a somewhat similar. This might be a Grande kit. I don't know. Yeah, might this might be a, a Monarch Grande. That one's 47 grams. Total pen, 26. We're, we're literally the entire pen with the blank is less than a normal kit, just the components itself. It's very light in the hand. That's nice. What do you guys think about this guy? You get on camera. Everything's reversed, so it's kind of weird. I'm digging it. Not too bad. And the stainless steel. Um, so what I'd like to do is I, I have the other half of the that blank that kind of sucked. What I'd like to do is turn this sometime. I don't know if I'll. I don't know if I want to waste time on a stream. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. Um, I might just turn this down and and but use a, a black uh, tube. I'm thinking black's probably the way to go on that. Um, yeah, because I want to darken it, I think. I still think that these blanks probably could have done with a lot more mica powder in them, but overall, I need to get some more of these kits. I really like that. It's so light. Like, it's noticeably different. Like, uh, I know that I'm just, you know, throwing out these, like, gram numbers and stuff, and that doesn't really mean a lot, but in the hand, it just, it's, it's like weightless feeling compared to most is the bee uh the bee is dead now can the bee hijack the show i know all load destructions <laughs> yeah correct response was what's a penway I'm totally lost. 
on that. Uh, yeah, not too bad though. Not too bad. I like that. So one thing uh, to note, so the aluminum is like shiny. Oh, that's not the right. Let's put it on the right camera. How about that? Right? So the aluminum is like a really bright, shiny, polished, uh, like finish. Whereas the, um, the stainless steel one is a little bit, you know, you can see it's like darker. It's almost more like a gunmetal kind of like it's like a darker color i don't know i don't know how, how else to it's almost brushed too so just to let you know if you're looking into them um the stainless steel again that's the you're talking like the, the weight of a normal kit i'm actually really curious now so let's 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 weigh the brass and, and copper one And again, I think that if you really, uh, I can't wait to do some, some, you know, the patina work on these. There's the copper. It just, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. Have you seen, if you haven't seen some of the stuff you can make with this, go and check out. Um, I'm guessing that they have pictures on their website. Follow that link and check out the pictures of some of the stuff. Chad's made some just ridiculous stuff. Like they, they just they're really awesome pens. The copper is 35 grams. Let's see where were we at? So the silver, the 35. So the copper weighs a little bit more even. That's even a little bit even more heavy. Interesting. But I kind of like that with with the copper. It, it that to me lends itself to that. Let me put this back in. I don't want to mix up all my components here. And the brass is 31. So pretty close to the stainless. Um, the the copper is the heaviest, and then the aluminum is like half the weight uh, of everything else. So that's pretty pretty cool. So I hope you guys give it a try. Um, I the tough thing for me is like the patina part is like you dump it in you know ammonia and then like let it sit so it's not something that i'm like super that that's why we haven't done it because i'm like well how am i supposed when am i supposed to do that on the stream like i don't know it might work if we do it cooking show style where i kind of go through like how i did it and then show you the results you know um, like start another one um, but then show you the results of one that I've already done. So should be pretty cool. So again, the link's up there. I'm going to get the link in the description also for people that are watching back. Um, I don't know, a little bit disappointing, uh, but I think that there is something to the way we did this. I don't, I think it's a valid way of doing things. I just make sure to put enough mica powder in. I think that um, going off of my numbers from, from the stream last week, maybe slightly lower the, the temperature that you wait to, to pour at. Maybe, you know, like maybe try like 105 uh, Fahrenheit or something like that. Depends on the temperature in your shop, of course. But maybe slightly go down on the temperature that you actually pour all the colors in at just slightly. But then like I would probably double uh, the mica powder. So like half teaspoon per 100 grams of resin. And I think that it would have been more impressive, um, especially with these like the layered um, parts. Um, so we'll have to kind of try it out. We, uh, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna have to do it again uh, with those other ideas that I had, where you kind of stagger. One idea was to to have like, I'm kind of over exaggerating, but when you pour all the colors in the cup, like maybe go with only two colors. Try that next time, and do like. A pretty significant amount of one color and then just a, a blip of, of the other just a, a thinner line and then a bigger and then a thinner so you kind of have a little bit more staggering and that might kind of i don't know i don't know what that'll do but it might kind of change from being just like a bunch of very thin lines in most of the blanks um what was the other thing i thought of something else that i i, I can't remember off the top of my head right now oh the other idea i had was instead of pouring it all into one big cup uh, maybe 
it would be the same like every cup would be the same thing in the end but like pour it into smaller cups um, because what i was finding was the first pours at, at at the beginning there was a lot more color separation and, and bigger blobs of color so that might be another way that seems a little bit kind of overly ridiculous to have to do that but i don't know kind of cool caddy that's what it's called it's a caddy Sweet. Yeah, David, the magic juice works really well. Um, I mean, for pretty much all of my kit pens, that's what I use. Um, and I know that it seems kind of silly that I would do something different, but on the on the um, on the kitless pens, I find that. I sometimes need to do a little bit of buffing. I just, I, I know exactly how to get perfect, get like get scratches out and do all that stuff. And if there's scratches left that I didn't catch, I want those things to be perfect. So sometimes I still use the buffing wheels, but for most things, Magic Juice, I mean, it's it's hands down awesome. Now, the biggest thing is you're, you're gonna get the best results if you can get, you know, do your sanding steps well. Um, and, and the Magic Juice is gonna, it is better than the white diamond wheel uh, with my buffing wheels. Because even if I do buff, I'm going back to Magic Juice uh, to finish usually at the higher uh, one or two. Actually, that's another thing that I wanted to mention to you guys. If you want something, and I actually specifically bought this and brought it home, I don't know what it is <laughs> exactly. Um, they call it ring bling at Turner's Warehouse. So um, if you if you just need something to add a little bit of higher polish, let's say that you usually use buffing wheels, or maybe you just, your, your typical thing is just to going, going through either the Zona papers or mag, uh, 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 what is it called? Micro mesh, and that's it. If you wanted to try something to add just like a, that, that like super high final polish, um, Turner's Warehouse has something called Ring Bling which is some uh, another polish. I don't think you, if you have your, your magic juice, you can probably just use number six. But um, if you got something, uh, is that even showing up? I don't know. <laughs> they don't even have like a label or anything. It's just ring bling is what they call it on Turner's Warehouse. But if you need something is just like a final high gloss, add a little bit of luster step, um, they got the ring bling. And I'm gonna try that out sometime on the show just to kind of see how it works. Um, but it, it would be like, I would use that um, if you know, if I'm doing a kitless pen, I'll, I'll go through my wet sanding and then I'm going to go to the um, uh, what is it called the um, Tripoli wheel, then the the white diamond, and then I would put it back on the lathe and use that ring bling just to bring it up to a little bit higher gloss. I, it, it definitely adds a different adds an extra um, gloss like sh uh, shine to it. So, <laughs> Doug's here. What's up, man? Sorry, man. We're 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 all finished up here. We're 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 shutting her down. Um, but anyway, guys, thanks for joining the fun. Big thanks, you, big thank you to Brian for the the ten dollars super chat. I appreciate that always. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, I will do. Like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna try seeing what this looks like with a a, a black um, tube behind it. Hopefully, that'll kind of help out a little bit. Um, and I don't know, cause we, we got this other one and it just, for anybody that's just showing up here, first one just wasn't awesome. Like it just, it could be, there are bands of color. The problem is I just didn't use enough mica powder. And so it's, they're just not standing out. It does have some shimmer if you get the right angle on the light, but this is what I'm, you know, when I look at this thing, this is what it looks like right here. Not, not particularly amazing. Um, and, and I, you can see the tube and all that. There's just, it was kind of a train wreck, uh, to be honest. So I'm going to try doing the other half of that blank with a black tube and see if that helps out. Um, but I'd recommend, you know, if you're going to go off of what we did last week, like double the, the amount of mica powder in yours and you should get better results. So anyway, guys, thanks for joining the fun tonight. I hope you have a great uh, rest of the weekend and then we'll be back in the, sh excuse me, back in the shop. I don't know what exactly what we're gonna do next week. There might be some resin casting. There might be, we might try the other, it's good to kind of just keep going with this stuff and, and, and get some more results right away. So I think we might, 
try a different method of dirty pour next week, maybe with some different colors and then uh, see how that goes. So anyway, uh, let's see here. There's a question here. Zeus, why do we have to gradually build up to the highest grit? Um, yeah, no, you can't just skip. Uh, you need to, the lower grits are gonna make sure that everything's nice and level. Um, you don't have any weird kind of bumps and all that kind of stuff, like tool marks. Um, so that's gonna kind of smooth out the surface. And then the way that sanding works is each grit is going to, you know, you start with, I started with 600 grit. Um, you're gonna go up to 1,000 grit to take out the 600 grit scratches. And then you're gonna, you know, if you wanted to keep going with sandpaper, you'd use like 1,500 grit so that you take out the 1,000 grit scratches. And as you're going up, those scratches are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually your eye can't perceive them. Um, once you get up to, you know, like your final polish. Um, this, there's still scratches technically, like microscopic, but um, the light, um, to get it glossy, what you're doing is you need to make the scratches smaller than the light hitting it so that it reflects right back into your eye when you're looking at it. So that's kind of the theory of, of sanding and, and how polishing and all that kind of stuff works. But you do need to kind of start at some grit to make sure you're getting out all, any tool marks or whatever. Then you have to you know, go through uh, a bunch of different grits to keep continually making those scratches smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, thousand, yeah. Well, thousand takes out the scratches left by 600, but um, you de you definitely don't want to double. Um, like you're not gonna use 2000 grit sandpaper to take out, you know, 600 grit. Like technically if you, if you sat there for an hour, it might take them out, but it it's not really the right way to do it. You have to, you don't want to double is kind of like the, the rule. Um, you could throw in 800 grit in the middle of 600 and 1,000. Like basically, I just have to work a little bit longer with the 1,000 grit, um, but it does take out 600 grit scratches. Um, but 1,500 is not really going to take out 600. Um, anyway, guys, so let's see here. Yeah, you guys answered that question too. So anyway, we're going to sign off. Uh, again, thanks for joining the fun, and I'll see you guys on next week's stream.